on World News Tonight. A fiery warning. Tensions between China and US rise as Xi Jinping warns Biden not to play with fire. Shrinking economy. Warning signs for a potential recession emerges in the United States. Escalating attacks. Russia strikes Kyiv area for the first time in weeks with dozens injured, including civilians. And let the games begin. Birmingham opened its Commonwealth Games in a spectacular style with a captivating ceremony. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, Birmingham opened its Commonwealth Games in a spectacular style with a captivating, hopeful ceremony at Alexander Stadium. Nobel Peace Prize laureate Malala Yousafzai emphasized the importance of education in a surprise appearance, while diver Tom Daly made a show of support for LGBTQ plus rights as the baton relay concluded. The weight of legacy hung in the air before the ceremony even began, as Birmingham residents flooded to the stadium to celebrate their city being at the center of the global event. The games are officially open with the events beginning today and more than 5,000 athletes representing 72 nations and territories competing in 280 medal events until 8th of August. U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping held marathon phone talks lasting for more than two hours. As widely expected, the two leaders largely focused on issues surrounding Taiwan. Chinese President Xi Jinping on Thursday warned U.S. President Joe Biden against playing with fire over Taiwan. As Beijing's concerns mounted over a possible visit by U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to the Chinese-claimed island. In a phone call that lasted over two hours, Chinese state media said Xi told Biden that the United States should abide by the One China principle and stressed that China firmly opposed Taiwanese independence and interference of external forces. Chinese state media quoted Xi as telling Biden, quote, those who play with fire will only get burnt. We hope the U.S. side can see this clearly. According to a White House statement, Biden told Xi that U.S. policy on Taiwan had not changed and that the United States strongly opposed unilateral efforts to change the status quo or undermine peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. Beijing has issued escalating warnings about repercussions should Pelosi, a Democrat like Biden, visit Taiwan which says it is facing increasing Chinese military and economic threats. A visit by the House Speaker would be a dramatic, though not unprecedented, show of U.S. support for the island. The last time a Speaker of the U.S. House visited Taiwan was in 1997, and as a co-equal branch of government, the U.S. executive has little control over congressional travel. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre told reporters during a briefing Thursday that Biden brought up genocide to Xi as well. He raised um, uh, genocide and forced labor practices uh, by the P PRC. That is something that he raised um, and he, uh, about the human rights, as he always does. This is, uh, as we've said, that any time the president has an opportunity, he raises that when he meets uh, with another leader and called on PRC to seize its ongoing human rights abuses uh, across China. The White House readout said the two leaders also discussed a range of other issues, including climate change and health security. U.S. officials said they saw the fifth call between Biden and Xi as another chance to manage competition between the world's two largest economies, whose ties have been increasingly clouded by tensions over democratically governed Taiwan, which Xi has vowed to reunite with the mainland by force if necessary. Now reports show the U.S. economy shrank for the second quarter in a row, with back-to-back -back contractions raising fears of recession. While the U.S. is seeing historic levels of inflation, consumer spending only increased 1% last quarter. However, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, while acknowledging that actively was slowing, refused to say the recession is underway. She says that while that the recession could be a possibility, there are signs of strength in the job market and household finances. The United States economy shrank again for a second consecutive quarter, beating the drum of recession. The U.S. Commerce Department on Thursday reported the advanced estimate that the country's gross domestic product for the April to June period fell at an annualized rate of 0.9 percent. 
The contraction follows a 1.6 percent decline in the first three months of this year. Despite inflation running at rates unseen in four decades, consumer spending, which accounts for some 70 percent of economic activity in the U.S., increased 1 percent in the second quarter. But the figure was less than the 1.8 percent growth in the first quarter. Also, the biggest drag on the GDP was a fall in business inventories, which have driven a two percentage point cut in the headline figure. Back-to-back -back quarterly contractions fueled concerns that the United States could be entering a recession or is signaling that one already had begun. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen during a news conference on Thursday did not rule out a possible recession, but she refused to concede that a recession is underway. Most economists and most Americans have a similar definition of recession substantial job losses and mass layoffs, businesses shutting down, private sector activities slowing considerably, family budgets under immense strain, in some, a broad-based weakening of our economy. That is not what we're seeing right now when you look at the economy. Job creation is continuing. Household finances remain strong. Consumers are spending and businesses are growing. Yellen also noted the administration's achievements during the last 18 months, but warned of several risks on the horizon. While our economy has been resilient in the face of numerous shocks over the past two years, I should also stress that there are numerous risks on the horizon, many of them global, that we remain highly attuned to. They include the outcome of the war in Ukraine, COVID lockdowns in China, and pandemic-related supply chain snarls. Still in the United States, U.S. President Joe Biden and he spoke to Democrat Senators Chuck Schumer and Joe Manchin to offer his support for a bill that would reduce the national debt, invest in energy technologies, and lower the cost of prescription drugs. U.S. President Joe Biden on Thursday urged Congress to pass a $430 billion drugs and energy bill, saying it is the strongest way to fight inflation and would make significant progress toward achieving his climate goals. Look, this bill is far from perfect. It's a compromise. But it is, it's often how progress is made, by compromises. And uh, the fact is that uh, my message to Congress is this. This is the strongest bill you can pass to lower inflation, cut the deficit, reduce health care costs, tackle the climate crisis, and promote energy security, all the time while reducing the burdens facing working class and middle class families. So pass it. Pass it for the American people. Pass it for America. Democrats huddled on Thursday to weigh the bill after conservative Democrat Joe Manchin and Majority Leader Chuck Schumer agreed to a deal late Wednesday after months of negotiations. But with Congress's summer recess set to begin next week, Schumer faces a tight deadline to get the spending bill passed against a strong Republican opposition. You try to hide the truth. That's assuming he has all 50 Democrats on board. Democratic Senator Kirsten Sinema, who, like Manchin, has blocked her party's legislative priorities in the past, has not weighed in on the proposal. The New Deal includes a 15 percent corporate minimum tax to help finance new spending on energy, electric vehicle credits and health insurance. It would allow Medicare to negotiate prescription drug prices and caps out-of-pocket costs for seniors at $2,000 per year. The bill will lower health care costs for millions of Americans. It will be, and uh, it will be the most important investment, not hyperbole, the most important investment we've ever made in our energy security and developing cost savings uh, and job creating clean energy solutions for the future. Top Senate Republican Mitch McConnell blasted the bill, calling it economically reckless at a time of soaring inflation. But McConnell has few ways of stopping the bill if Schumer keeps his caucus united and healthy amid a spate of COVID-19 infections among senators. Getting the bill passed would be a win for Biden and could boost Democratic lawmakers' election prospects in November, giving them a better chance of retaining control of Congress.
British intelligence says the Ukrainian military's ongoing counter-offense to retake the city of Kherson in the country's south appears to be gaining momentum. But Ukraine says that Russia is massively redeploying its troops into defensive positions. On Thursday, Russia conducted missile strikes against the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv, marking the first attacks in the region in 54 days. In only the first half of this day, and only in Kyiv, there were four air alarms. The Russian army launched missile attacks on the Kyiv region. Russian forces also pounded the northern Cherniv region as well, with Ukrainian officials calling the latest attack Russia's revenge for standing up to the Kremlin. Russia attacked the Kyiv region with six missiles launched from the Black Sea, hitting a military unit in a village on the outskirts of the capital. Kyiv's regional governor says the attack wounded 15 people, including five civilians. The attacks also came on the day Ukraine was commemorating its statehood day, which was established by President Zelensky last year through a decree to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Ukraine's independence. Today we celebrated the day of Ukrainian statehood for the first time, and I was happy to see how many people received this holiday warmly, congratulated on it, smiled and were proud of Ukraine. The Ukrainian leader instituted the day of statehood to remind Ukrainians about the country's history as an independent state. Ukrainian officials also believe the assaults were a response to the day of commemoration, which they say Russia views as a form of resistance. Russian forces had previously withdrawn from the Kyiv region months ago after failing to capture it. However, the renewed strikes come a day after the leader of pro-Kremlin separatists in the east urged Russian forces to liberate Russian cities founded by Russian people, including the Ukrainian capital. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, the Earth Overshoot Day marks the date on which humanity has consumed all the resources that the Earth can sustainably produce in one year. The date has been steadily coming earlier, barring the occasional expectation since 1970. Every year it creeps in a little earlier, the day when humanity has consumed all the resources the Earth can generate for that year. From this day, the Earth is living on borrowed credit until December 31st. The Earth has a lot of stock, so we can deplete Earth for some time, but we cannot overuse it forever. It's like with money. We can spend more money than we earn for some time until we're broke. Calculated for over 50 years by the NGO Global Footprint Network, the date is defined using six different categories, including crops, forest space and fishing zones. As lifestyles have grown more urban and consumer-driven, the date has come to pass earlier and earlier in the year, going from the 29th of December in 1970 to the 7th of August in 2010. But activists say there are still ways we can slow down its progress through the calendar. In 2020, the COVID crisis and lockdowns around the world led to a drop in resource consumption. That year, Overshoot Day came three weeks later than in 2019. North Korea is ready to eliminate the South Korean government and military if there is a preemptive attack that's coming from the regime's leader who also accused the United States of double standards over its military activities. Kim Jong-un's comments came during his first public appearance in nearly three weeks. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un says his country is ready to mobilize its nuclear war deterrent and counter any U.S. military clash. Our armed forces are thoroughly prepared to respond to any crisis, and our state's nuclear war deterrence is also fully ready to mobilize its absolute strength faithfully, accurately, and promptly to its mission. Kim's remarks came during a speech marking the 69th anniversary of the July 27th Korean War armistice, which left the two Koreas technically still at war, according to KCNA news agency on Thursday. He also criticized South Korea's new president for the first time, warning Seoul was pushing towards the brink of war. If you think you can neutralize or destroy part of our military power, it's nonsense. Such a dangerous attempt will immediately be punished by a powerful force, and Yoon Suk-yul's government and his army will be annihilated. 
Yoon's office said South Korea is capable of strongly and effectively responding to provocations at any time. His presidential office spokesperson, Kang In-sun. We express deep regret that Chairman Kim Jong-un made threatening remarks at our government while mentioning the president by name during a speech at an event marking the war armistice's anniversary. Kim claimed the threat the U.S. has posed to the North since the 1950-53 war required it to achieve an urgent historical task of beefing up its self-defense. Insun reiterated the South's wish that North Korea would, quote, take the path of dialogue to achieve substantive denuclearization and peace. Kim's speech came after Seoul and Washington officials said Pyongyang had completed preparations to conduct its first nuclear test since 2017. The South Korean minister handling inter-Korean affairs said on Tuesday there was a possibility of the test around the anniversary of the armistice, though a military official said there were no immediate signs for it. South Korea's foreign minister said on Wednesday that the North will likely face stronger sanctions if the test goes ahead. In Wednesday's speech, Kim said Washington continues what it calls dangerous, illegal, hostile acts against the North and seeks to justify its behavior by demonizing the country. The North has long accused the United States of double standards over military activities and hostile policy towards Pyongyang. It claims the U.S. is hampering a restart of talks aimed at dismantling the country's nuclear and missile programs in return for sanctions relief. The presidents of South Korea and Indonesia held a bilateral summit where the two agreed to boost their bilateral cooperation on various areas including supply chain stabilization. Indonesian President Joko Widodo arrived at Seoul's new presidential office Thursday afternoon, welcomed with a guard of honor, marking his first official visit since South Korean President Yoon suk took office in May. During their first face-to-face, -face, the presidents of South Korea and Indonesia saw eye-to-eye -eye on the importance of expanding cooperation beyond the traditional realms. That stabilizing supply chains for key minerals, Indonesia's rich nickel reserves, and establishing a strategic partnership on high-tech industries such as one on electric vehicle batteries. Altogether, Yun and Jokowi, as is widely known, agreed on boosting bilateral cooperation on supply chains, economic security, infrastructure, and defense. Yoon said the two also shared concerns about North Korea's nuclear missile threats, agreed to support a concerted international response to the North weapons programs, and reaffirmed their commitment to the KF-21 fighter jet development program. Widodo welcomed South Korea's investments in electric vehicle battery and facilitating Indonesia's $32 billion project to relocate its capital from Jakarta to Nusantara on Borneo Island. I thank South Korea for supporting Indonesia's G20 presidency this year, and I look forward to welcoming President Yoon in Bali come November. A member of the G20, Indonesia's economic output accounts for more than a third of the total GDP of the entire ASEAN and its 270 million strong population, over 40 percent of that of the Union. Chinese billionaire Jack Ma plans to cede control of Ant Group after a regulatory crackdown that scooped its $37 billion IPO in 2020 and led to a forced restructuring of the financial technology. Jack Ma plans to give up control of China's Ant Group. That's according to the Wall Street Journal on Thursday. The Chinese billionaire only owns a 10% stake in Ant, but he has control over the company through related entities. The journal said Ma planned to move some of his voting power to Ant officials. Ma has been restructuring his huge e-commerce and fintech empire over the last few years. He started doing so after a regulatory clampdown on the industry by Chinese regulators from late 2020 onwards. Ma was a flamboyant leader of Alibaba, but he's kept a low profile ever since. The journal said Ant had informed officials of Ma's intention. That, as the firm prepares to become a financial holding company regulated by China's central bank. Any change in control at Ant could further slow plans to revive its initial public offering. Regulators derailed Ant's planned $37 billion IPO, which would have been the world's largest. 
Now China's domestic A-share market requires companies to wait three years after a change in control to list. Earlier this week, Alibaba's annual reports showed Ant executives are no longer part of Alibaba partnership, a further sign the two were decoupling. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. Some Afghans who were displaced following the conflict in the country received assistance to return to their home provinces. British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss and bookmaker's favourite to succeed Prime Minister Boris Johnson in a Conservative Party leadership election said that she would not impose further windfall taxes on oil and gas companies. Protesters in Lebanon stormed bakeries and pastry shops amid the country's deepening food crisis. Patients ran out as people vented their frustrations over hours-long queues in the scorching heat for state-subsidized bread. Australia has recorded its highest rate of inflation in more than 20 years with consumers paying more for everything. Floods caused by monsoon rains have killed at least 110 people and injured scores of others in southwest Pakistan. Rescuers and soldiers are using boats and helicopters to rescue people stranded in inundated villages. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we are leaving you tonight with a look at the captivating performance that opened the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. Stay safe, have a good night and have a great weekend.